Exactly. So the key thing here is where do we kind of draw the line between period zero and period one? I think in most of the medical literature, the rule of thumb that was floating around at the time, and of course now with antiretrovirals, it's, it's less relevant because people are getting treated, but was people were sick before dying, people were actively sick with AIDS for somewhere between one to two years before dying, something like that. That was the kind of rule of thumb. If that's the case, if that's right, then maybe going back three years or two to three years before the death is something close to a pre-period. It's like before the, before the treatment group is sick, before the event, right? Okay, so as a rough distinction, and I'll take that hand one sec. As a rough distinction, if we think people kind of start getting sick somewhere here, then maybe this area here is t equals zero, maybe, if we believe the, the medical research. And then maybe this period here is t equals one. And then there's this intermediate period where they're probably starting to get sick or some of them are getting sick, but it's, it's a little less clear exactly what's going on in that, in that middle period. So, but maybe we want to group that in with t equals one. Maybe not. There's a hand up. I think they have that, but it, it varied a lot across individuals. They know when the individual died or left work, and they knew that the cause was HIV AIDS, was AIDS, but I think different people were diagnosed at very different points, so they don't, they don't bring that into the analysis. And of course, from the point of view of productivity, when you're diagnosed or when the company finds out your illness may not be the relevant thing. The relevant thing may just be when you start getting sick, you know, when you start seeing the productivity effects. Okay. So just to be kind of conservative, let's look at this period here and say this is baseline. And let's look at this period here as follow-up. Now, let me just re-ask the question. Maybe Jan can take a, take a crack at it if he wants or somebody else. Do the difference and difference assumptions seem to hold? And remember, there was this whole thing we talked about last time about parallel trends. Before the event, before the event, are the treatment and control groups sort of evolving similarly in some sense? What do people think? I don't know if there's one right answer, but you can get a sense visually. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind of bouncing around, but they're, you know, they're, they're pretty close to each other. And definitely the fitted lines are kind of look like they're, you know, there's a little bit of curvature, but it kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like they're kind of trending. It's pretty flat, and they're pretty similar. So that's one view that, that maybe this is, this is appropriate. Now, of course, if you really don't start getting sick until here, then this intermediate period makes it look like they're starting to diverge earlier on. But, you know, a more conservative way would probably be to look between years two and three. What are other people's, sorry, take on this? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's the average across the whole treatment sample in the circles and the whole control sample in the Xs over a three-month window. It's their average daily kilograms of T+. plus. Yes, all the T plus so that three-month period by all the treatments per day. They kind of normalize it per day. Work. And I'll come back to that because there's actually going to turn out to be a different number of days work. We'll talk about that soon. That's another way in which being sick can affect you with absenteeism, as we found in the deworming case, right? In case you're sick, you just don't go to school. Okay. So we have one answer saying, look, they look pretty parallel. Um, if we do buy that there are parallel trends, then we would say, look, you know, there's like a little bit of a difference at baseline. If we look at the difference in the fitted lines, this is sort of, um, sorry, this is kind of the baseline difference here. But when we get to the end, we have a difference here. So the difference in difference effect would be the difference between those two differences. That's why it's called difference in differences. So this would be, we could call this delta zero. The, change, the difference at time zero, this would be the difference at time one. And the difference in difference effect is delta one minus delta zero. And that's just the formula we had before. Does that make sense? Visualizing it this way maybe makes difference in difference a little more concrete. What's neat about this data is now we don't just have two time points. We have all these time points day by day. And we have to almost come up with some way to aggregate. We have to decide what is baseline. What do we classify as the treatment period or not? And a conservative way to do it might be to throw out that middle, that middle period. But they can characterize the gap really like week by week or day by day. So that's, that's clear. So it's interesting. They, in their analysis, they say in the paper, they control for seasonality. They control, I think, for month effects. They don't, they don't specify exactly, again, it's the style of paper, but they say they control for seasonality. So the only explanation I can give for, say, why in that third quarter, see, I mean, this was pointed out before, how they both kind of bounce up, is sampling variation, that there's just some noise over time. Um, it's the only explanation if they, control, if they actually do control for everything they say they control for in the paper, like controlling for seasonality. You might expect to see those kinds of trends due to seasonality with, you know, with weather. But you know, if you go further down, you don't see a similar kind of pattern at year two or year one. So it must, it must just be sampling variation, meaning for whatever reason, with only a couple hundred workers, you're going to get some noise, basically, in the data. That's the only explanation I can give for it. But it seems pretty stark. It's way above the fit and stuff, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, so this is their productivity as long as they're working. Now, once they leave work, so these are the sort of illness-related retirements, they're not in the data set. They're not setting their productivity to zero, which, as you're saying, would be a reasonable way to go. Like, they're not productive during that time period. So they're capturing something narrower here. They're saying, among those who, are, who have AIDS, who are still healthy enough to like, show up at work, even among them, their productivity is falling a lot, it looks like here. But of course, there's all the people who like, couldn't go to work at all. I'll talk about absenteeism in a second. Uh, and those who, you know, not only are just absent more, they just like, leave work. So this is like a massive underestimate of the productivity effect, because these are only the people who are still showing up at work. That's a very important thing. And that's really what the authors emphasize in the paper, is saying, this is a lower bound on, on the real economic cost. But even here, among the relatively healthy people that show up at work, you're seeing this big drop. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, so at this time, 1997 to 2002, none of them were on ARVs. ARVs were just not available in Korea. And they mentioned explicitly that the hospital didn't have access to them. Uh, it was really only a couple places in Nairobi that a few people were getting them in 2002. And then in 2003, I think I mentioned last time, in 2003, in Eldorado and a couple other places, they started rolling out ARVs. So this is data like just before ARVs become available. Yeah, you know, they, they don't mention that, but my guess is they focus on controls that have a continuous work history. That's my guess. 
but they don't they don't specify that exactly. Let me ask you to comment. Let's look at one more thing. You see that the time plot of the dashed line, the, the, the you know the treatments falls a lot over time, presumably because people are getting sick. There's a little bit of a trend downward in the controls. What are at least a couple explanations for that you can think of? So these folks are getting three years older, and as people get older in the sample, they get less productive. That's probably the most clear, direct interpretation. What's another interpretation of it? Yeah. You mean the, the controls? So maybe they're, they're losing motivation over time. They're not getting older. They're just kind of losing motivation. So that you know, over time, it's a rack-breaking job. You just kind of lose productivity and motivation. Just yeah, maybe over time, even if you don't get older, you know, they don't replace all the tea plants regularly. So productivity falls naturally over time. Yeah. They're not getting raised. They're not working harder. They're getting demotivated. That's the reason why. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And the authors mentioned that as a possibility. Of course, by definition, they don't have data on that. And they only have the data on people that went to the hospital. So it might be that some of that dip is controls who either are not yet diagnosed themselves. They're in year between year two and one over there. So they're already seeing a dip. Or they're diagnosed. They're just not reporting it to the hospital because they don't want to lose their job or something like that. Is that what you were going to say? Does that make sense? That's interesting. That's interesting. In a couple slides, we'll come back to this issue of workers and others helping each other out because that becomes an issue in some of the data. Okay. You guys have done awesome. You've really thought this through. Let me just go through because I've kind of on the slide documented some of this. So again, T equals one of the cases, T equals zero of the controls you can see here. If we take the pre-period as early as possible, about three years early, and we take the post-period to be the last point in time, that would be a very natural way to do it. And that could be t equals zero and t equals one in our previous sort of definition. And um, we discussed the issue of parallel trends, where it seems plausible there's some parallel trends in the first year or so of the data. Let's actually look at the data. So in addition to the figure, they actually create a table where they regress productivity on these different individual characteristics, as well as the indicator variable, the dummy variable for AIDS, for, for eventually dying of you know, what they call AIDS-related determination. Sounds terrible. Um, and um, you can see three years and two and a half years before, and even two years before, the difference in productivity between these two groups is only a few percent, one way or the other. They look very similar. Three years before, two years before, or two and a half years before. But then the productivity gap really increases here, where positive means the control group is more productive. So again, we, you know, they're, we're calling t equals one treatment. They're kind of doing it the opposite way. We would think of these as negative numbers. But basically, by the end, there's a 19% difference in productivity. So these folks who end up dying or leaving work due to AIDS, in their very last few months, they're quite a bit less productive than, than the other workers. But early on, they looked kind of the same. So if we make the same division we talked about before into pre and post, t equals zero and t equals one, this would be a very natural comparison to make between the earliest few quarters and the last few quarters. And if we do that, the difference and differences, um, oh, and I should just say one last thing. You can see the p values here near termination are very statistically significant. So p less than 0.01, much less than 0.01. These are very significant differences. At baseline, there's no significant difference. Okay, so this is difference zero, we're calling it. If you average those, uh, that data is about plus one percent. And difference one, or delta one, is about minus 17 percent. I've switched signs. The signs I have in the blue are consistent with our regressions, not with the way they've done it. Okay, just so you don't get completely confused. It's consistent with our regression. So what's the difference in difference? Minus 18 percent. That's the difference in difference sort of here, taking their data and putting it into our regression. Let me pause and see if there's any questions or comments. Yeah. Yeah. The, the key thing about the parallel trends is they have to be parallel before the event. I should have been clear about that. As long as they're parallel before the event, in theory, we're okay. After the event, of course, they could diverge because the treatment's doing stuff. So when we're talking about parallel trends, the key thing is parallel trends, pre-period, baseline period, pre-event, pre-treatment. After the treatment, we're testing whether they're still parallel trends. So that's okay if they diverge. We're trying to estimate that effect. Does that make sense? I, I, maybe I wasn't clear on that. I just took the averages. So instead of doing um, minus four plus one and doing plus, you know, doing minus, uh, I mean, of course I switched the signs, but instead of doing, you know, minus plus one and a half, I just did plus one. Uh, and then, you know, the average between 16 and 19, instead of doing, you know, 17 and a half, I did 17. I think I should have just done it with a half. I was just kind of rounding it one way or the other. It would only make a difference of one percent or something. So sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't clear. Okay, so, you know, taking it back to our regression, let's just now just map what we just did into our regression. The difference in difference estimator is the difference between what we have called equations two and three, the difference between the two groups over time. So diff one minus diff zero, we get our minus 18%. Okay, so, you know, this is just walking through, but I think you guys already understand. Now, why are these results a lower bound? I mean, how can we really interpret these results? We've seen this effect of minus 18%. But we know that the folks who left work because of AIDS, they died. I mean, their productivity went to zero. So we're clearly underestimating the effect. But even within this data set, you can start kind of adding up effects that are much larger than 18%. So what are those? First, absenteeism increases a lot. In other words, missing work increases a lot among those who end up dying. In fact, days of missed work doubles in the last two years. So even be between one to two years before the death, absenteeism starts going up a lot, which is really an indication that these folks are starting to get sick then. So their, their actual day-to-day -day productivity when they're at work isn't that different. They're just missing more work. They just don't have the energy to work every day. When you look at, and then there's another thing, which is interesting in the paper, which is if you are ill, and this is you know, typically for people that were temporarily ill, you can do non-plucking work just for a day or two. You can like sweep the floor in the, in the uh, room where they package the tea or something, like very low energy work relative to plucking. So if you just look at the amount of tea actually plucked in the last uh, year, it actually falls 35%, so twice as much as what our difference in differences was. So when these folks are in the last year of life, they're just way less productive than healthy people, which makes sense, because in the last year of life, if you have full-blown AIDS, you're very sick. So that's, that 35% is probably a better number. That's right. So you know, the, the numbers there were all kilograms per day you worked plucking tea. But if you actually say, no, no, just total kilograms of tea plucked. And again, this is where, because this is a very tight, short paper with only a couple tables, they didn't work this out. I think in an econ-style paper, we would have had our 12 tables and 15 figures and would have shown that, which is kind of a good number. But anyway, they, they mentioned in the text, it's 35%, huge effect. Closer to what we think is reasonable. Okay, and now that is getting us to our clicker question. And I realize I never turned on the clicker. 
So I need to turn on the clicker. Hold on. OK, the clicker is on. So. Hold on. Oh, I need to press the button. Thanks, guys, for being patient with me. You guys are like, oh, he'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> OK. Um, now I just got to get my slides working again. Hold on. Oh, come on. Who's doing slideshow? Oh, here we go. Got it. Excellent. OK. Um, so if some in the control group are already suffering from AIDS, as we were just discussing and several of you brought up, will our difference in difference estimate, estimator overstate the true impact of AIDS-related morbidity? Understate? Bias could go in the direction? I don't know. And I think most of you answered for me. Um, okay, so you guys pretty much, I think we mentioned this, and almost all of you got it kind of in the right direction. We're going to understate the effect um, because the control group is, uh, has falling productivity over time, too. Makes sense. Okay, so I think you guys have a good sense of that. And what I wanted to mention is think of this a little bit like the deworming case again. It's a form of contamination of treatment. In other words, in this case, it's really misclassification of treatment. Some people in the control group are treated with AIDS, and that narrows the gap between treatment and control. But it's a lot like the deworming externalities where you know, some people in the control group are, being affected by, are also affected by the treatment in a certain way. So it'll lead us probably to understate effects. That's the most externalities that sort of have the same effect on the treatments and the controls would tend to dampen that difference, reduce the difference. Yeah, they, they counted as zero T plucked, but they also did not count as a T plucking workday in that per day calculation. Exactly, which is one way of looking at it. You know, if you're out in the field, just physically, how much do you pluck? But we're missing out on this whole dimension of absenteeism that way. So it's a very conservative lower bound, almost certainly. Yeah. I think, I, mm, I forget if they mentioned that now. That's a really good question. The question is, you know, that's right. You, you know, there's an argument for throwing it out if for whatever reason the days when the sick folks were absent were somehow different. Like, you know what, I'm really sick. I'm barely holding it together to work. And we know when it's rainy and cold, I don't work those days. Because it'll just you know push you over the edge if you have all these other infections because of AIDS. So the fear would be that the control group guys, if their data is counted on those days, then maybe your productivity is just lower on these wet days. So you can't pluck the leaves as well, right? I don't know. I don't know exactly what they do with that. Maybe they mentioned on the paper, but I don't remember. I just figured out the paper day. I don't remember. They mentioned that. That's a very good, very specific question. Yeah. We don't know if they know that. So the question is, because of confidentiality rules, even though the company knows the worker's health status, the worker may not share that with others, or they might. We just don't know. Yeah, the fields are mixed gender. Definitely, and that might be one of the reasons why you see this kind of effect. That, that there's a dip. Like you said, there's different explanations, but that could be one reason. That could be one reason. And this is you know, just one way to interpret the figure is if we kind of take the slope in the control group and imagine that that slope is going to kind of stay the same over time, and it need not, remember, people are getting older and, and whatnot, but if for whatever reason that slope stays the same, that's the blue line that I drew. So there's a possibility that that dip over time is some sort of HIV AIDS effect in the control group. Possibly. We just can't interpret it. We don't have the data, but that's one possibility. In which case, the true HIV AIDS effect would be like kind of the sum of those two dips there, right? Yeah. Well, it, could, it definitely might matter, but we're kind of ignoring them. We're ignoring that dip in the control group. Again, very conservatively and saying, control group dipping, we don't know why. We're just going to kind of take the difference between treatment and control here. But the trends in the control group may tell us something interesting. Remember, I think when we were talking about the deworming case, I mentioned how, I think I mentioned this just offhand. It wasn't on the slide that in some of the studies before our study where they randomized deworming treatment within the same school, I think there were like four or five studies, and the control groups in all those studies show these big drops in worm infections over time. And that's presumably because of the externality. Like they're in a school with all these treated people, so they're getting healthier over time. And so if you ignore that externality, you're kind of like missing out on a big part of the treatment effect. So the question is if for some reason that dip in the control group here is an HIV effect, again, we're like missing out on some of the effects. But we can't quantify that in this case. Okay. So we talked about the second point. The third point, and this is really interesting. On these farms, since people live on the plantations with their families, when they're sick and they can't pluck that much, they very often ask their relatives to take a day off from work, they ask their kids to take a day off from school to help them pluck. And they have no data on how many of these helpers are out there. So as I started, you know, if I start getting sick two years, one and a half years before I end up actually dying or, or being forced to leave work, and you know, one day a week my brother, my wife, my kids help me out plucking, then the data on these folks is really inflated. They might be much less productive than shown here. So the, even the 35% drop is a, probably a way underestimate. And the authors of the paper say, you know, in their conversations with the field managers on the farm, they thought this was like really widespread, that helpers were coming in when people got sick. Yeah. So 